does need more seats, we can borrow them from next door. Um, we're expecting a few more people to come in. If you do see them and we have empty space, please just let them fill in where they can. just coming in, uh, there are some extra chairs, I believe, in the back of the room um, adjacent to here. Uh, we have a slightly larger attendance than we originally thought we would. Case. I'm with the Board of Directors here uh, with ANN. Um, we have the pleasure today to have with us uh, Dr. Stan Applebaum. Uh, Stan, Dr. Applebaum is a certified fellow at the College of Optometrists in Vision Development. He has been in private practice with his wife, Barbara Basin, um, for 20 years in Bethesda in Annapolis, Maryland, combining vision therapy with sensory integration occupational therapy in the same office. He is board certified in vision therapy and lectures on topics uh, related to infant vision development, visually related learning disabilities, visual problems, uh, special needs of children and adults, bright children and adults who do not like or to or get fatigued when they read, vision rehabilitation, um, strabismus, um, and other visual demands of computer use and sports vision. Uh, Dr. Applebaum uh, will be uh, speaking. He is a neuro-optometry expert in this case and vision therapy. Uh, Dr. Applebaum, thank you for coming again this year, and I will turn over the podium. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about um, vision problems, not eyesight problems but vision problems, and there's a difference. And if you don't understand the difference, you're not alone. A lot of doctors don't understand the difference. So eyesight problems are problems seeing street signs, or when you go to the eye doctor's office, seeing those little letters on the letter chart, or if you're in a classroom situation, but <coughs> what the uh, professor or teacher writes on the board, those are eyesight problems. Vision problems, or how the eyes work together and how they move together, focusing, remembering what you're seeing, processing information, not falling down, having good balance, not being dizzy, not getting car sick. Vision problems cause eyesight problems. I shouldn't say we're not going to talk about eyesight problems, but I want to differentiate the two. We're going to talk about hidden visual problems with nystagmus patients, because it's pretty obvious some of the problems with the oscillations and the reduced acuity 
Those are pretty obvious. But there's some hidden problems that uh, we're going to talk about. And uh, uh, I don't know if you made enough handouts for everyone. Everyone have a handout? If you don't, uh, um, uh, they might have run out. My email address will be listed. You email me, and I can send you everything that uh, people have in their hand. And if you want an email copy, too, you can have that as well. So first of all, um, I want to talk about um, what nystagmus is. Just real quickly, uh, move, abnormal movement, rhythmic oscillations, occurs independently or superimposed upon one's own normal eye movements. Okay? And it can be either congenital or acquired. And the motion is either jerk or pendular. So the jerk pattern, uh, slow in one direction, then rapid return by a corrective saccade toward the starting point. Saccade. What that means is there's two primary eye movements. There's ocular motor pursuits following an object across your visual space. Then there's saccadic fixations going from one object to the other. Both are important in reading. Both are important in looking at what's on your iPhone or your Blackberry. Both are important in driving. Both are important in life. Pendular forms symmetrical slow eye movements occurring in both directions. And there can be motor nystagmus, mostly congenital, sensory nystagmus acquired, associated with reduced vision of any cause, and of course motor nystagmus certainly becomes available, comes, becomes obvious six weeks to three months of age. And uh, one in several thousand people congenital, and this really shocked me, I got it from the ANN website, I didn't even know this, um, one in every 670 children by age two in the Oxfordshire, England survey. Um, anyone else have heard this before? I didn't know this, that's pretty prevalent. Um, abnormality of the eyes causes imbalance of the brain's eye movement mechanism. And of course it could be albinism, optic nerve issues, can cataracts, retinal problems, idiopathic, that means the doctor doesn't know what caused it. That's what idiopathic means. And uh, it can be associated with sensory problems, but what is it? It's an instability in the motor system controlling the eyes. The NIH researchers up here in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, just outside my office, um, have documented that now over 90% of the brain is related to vision. Not eyesight. Eyesight's a small area in the back of the brain, the occipital cortex, about this big. But 90% of the brain is involved in where things are, and how big things are, and remembering what you're seeing, and processing information. So you can have nystagmus or not have nystagmus and have a vision problem, okay? So treatments. There have been a number of things that have been tried. Unfortunately, not really successfully. Uh, a lot of attempts, low vision aids have been successful. Good lighting has been successful. Medications, not so much. Uh, the surgery, uh, not so much, can kind of improve the head position, allowing for better vision. But you know, there are a few surgical successes, but you know, if it worked, everybody would be doing it, right, of course. And prism glasses, not so much. Um, trying to shift the null zone into the primary or straight ahead position. Of course, the null zone, you know, whenever I say things like null zone, I usually lose half of the group, probably not this group, <laughs> but what is that null zone? It's the place where nystagmus is least and vision is best. Isn't that a great way to describe, you know, what the null zone is, okay? But it's a position, it's a gaze angle. Well, guess what? 20% of the optic nerve fibers don't go to our brains. That's the way we're all made. One out of five optic nerve fibers don't go to our brains. A direct connection from eyes to neck, back, shoulders, and other postural mechanisms. So we're going to be talking a lot about that 20%. So adverse side effects of the surgery in prisons, double vision, visual fatigue, balance problems. Okay? The medical literature unfortunately reports some disappointing long-term results. So abnormal posture, this is a big issue with nystagmus. And if the null zone is present when looking upward, then chin down head posture will result to place the eyes in Gaze, okay? If the null zone is present when looking to the right, then the left face head turn posture results to place the eyes in right gaze, okay? So we're gonna talk about visual and vestibular problems. So anybody know what the vestibular system is? Yeah. 
balance. Keeps your balance, good. Anybody else want to add to that? Isn't it kind of coordination between your eyes and your ears? Yes. Anything else? Let me tell you how I understand the vestibular system. Um, as you'll probably learn from this hour we have together, um, I'm a very practical doctor. I like to explain things in pretty simple terms, which is why I wrote a book. And the book is called Eye Power. Um, I brought several copies. Uh, if anybody wants to purchase one, you'll see me when I'm done. Uh, but this is a book that I wrote with a patient. And it's all about uh, how we can improve the visual system and things you can do right away. There's a whole chapter of things, procedures, that can be done to significantly improve vision and reduce symptoms. So, the vestibular system. It's the system, as I understand it, that tells us which way is up and which way is down. Okay? And if you go into the mall, like the Pentagon Mall or, or the Annapolis Mall by my Annapolis office, um, it's that system, you know, you go in, you see that map, and it says, you are here, and Sears is over there, and CVS is over here. The vestibular system is, is your own arrow in the map of life. Where is Andrew located? That's the vestibular system. One of the most basic systems in the body. <laughs> this is what I specialize in, in working with patients who have vestibular problems. You might not know you have a vestibular problem, but anybody in the room get car sick or motion sick? Okay. Well, we used to think car sickness and motion sickness was also all meant inner ear. Reader's disease, inner ear disturbances, too much wax, inner ear infections. The new research indicates that most car sickness, motion sickness, dizziness, vertigo is visual. So I get a lot of referrals from the ear specialists. Because if the ear specialists and the therapists who work with patients with the vestibular problems or balance problems, if their work doesn't work, then it's got to be vision. And almost always it is. Uh, sometimes we don't know what causes it. So vestibular problems can cause car motion sickness. It can make you dizzy, headache, or nausea. Headaches are hard to diagnose, but the headaches that are frontal or temporal, any doctor will tell you, go get your eyes examined. Frontal and temporal and around the eyes. If you get those headaches, think eyes. It's not always, but most of the time it is. Okay? Uh, vertigo, dizziness, feeling sleepy when reading. Anybody feel sleepy when reading in the room? Uh, and some of you won't raise your hand, but I know you do. Okay. I don't mean, you know, hit long day at work, hit the pillow, get in bed, open a book, fall asleep. That's cool. That's a, that's a cheap sleeping book. Uh, that's not a problem. That's the only time it happens. But anybody feel sleepy in the morning when they're reading? Or in the afternoon? Or after a good nap? Or after a good night's sleep? That is almost always a vision problem. Think about it. What are you doing when you're reading? Your eyes have to move together. Now, in your handouts here, there should oh, I have a couple of extra handouts. Pass these to the back for the people who didn't get one. Um, so, anybody not get one? Oh, a lot of people. I don't think they can get it now. My goodness, I have to do everything here. All right, so there's some for this group, and there's some for, for this group. Now, I don't be reading these things while I'm talking. But I'll take them back. You can glance at them, but, uh, you know, uh, some doctors don't like to hand out things, you know, when they're talking. Uh, but uh, uh, the first one is eyesight or vision problem. I'm just going to point out to what you have here. Uh, is it an eyesight problem or is it a vision problem? I gave you the short answer. This is the long answer, the difference between the two. Uh, the second page is nystagmus and vision therapy. We're going to talk about what, uh, how vision therapy can uh, help patients with nystagmus, and this gets into it. And the last page is acquired brain injury and hidden vision problems. Okay. Now, you'll also, when you get this handout, notice that uh, there's a website on the top, and the website is visionhelp.com. V-I-S-I-O-N-H-E-L-P uh, -E is in Paul, visionhelp.com. That's a website I maintain with just a dozen other eye doctors around the country. Uh, I'm the only one in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area on that website, so I'm real easy to find. All of us are professors in medical schools or optometry schools. All of us have written books. We don't sell anything on the website. It's all informative. 
geared towards patients and parents. And it's the only one of its kind. We decided to do this uh, several years ago. And there's some videos for people who don't like to read, and you can still get the information. So falling asleep when reading, attention difficulties. NIH, again, I love to quote NIH because it's right around the corner from my Bethesda office. NIH just recently did a study to indicate that anyone who has a convergence problem, problems getting both eyes to converge inward as you bring a finger or a pen close, are you ready for this? 10 times more likely to be mislabeled as having ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, learning problems, it's from NIH, Johns Hopkins, Harvard University, Mayo Clinic, multi-million dollar study, placebo control, published in the AMA Journal. We thought it would get the cover of Newsweek and Time when it came out last year. But, you know, what's this country all about? I hate to show you some of my biases, but I will. Uh, what's this country about? Oil and drugs, right? Isn't that running this country? Oils and drugs, oil and drugs? This ain't about oil. And it's sort of against drugs, isn't it? You know? And so what we're finding is that anyone with a convergence problem who goes through a therapy program in an office with a doctor who's board certified as I am in vision therapy, um, once the convergence problem has been solved, which it can be in most cases, guess what? The visual attention problem is gone. There's no more ADHD because it never was there to begin with. Now, the two things can coexist. You can have ADHD and have a convergence problem. I have, I've seen that many times. But you know, ADHD, the, the current thinking in the neurology and the psycho, neuropsychologist is that ADHD is a diagnosis of exclusion. You rule everything else out, like brain tumors. You gotta rule those out. You have to make sure that there's no auditory issues and uh, no visual. If you, if you ruled everything out, then all that's left is ADHD, and that patient needs Ritalin or Concerta or Adderall or own ADHD medications. And I'm not against drugs, there's a place for it, but I think it shouldn't be the first thing that we do. It should be the last thing that we look at. So attention difficulties, balance problems, okay? Um, we work with a lot of patients with balance problems. I have medical staff privileges at the National Rehab Hospital down in downtown in uh, DC. And uh, you know, what is the number one uh, symptom of patients who have brain injury, car accidents, number one symptom that they complain of. What do you think? Number one symptom. Yes. Had it? No? Yes. Nope. Nope. Anybody? Everybody misses this. Double vision. Oh my God. You get a brain injury, you're having double vision. Unless you've learned to turn off an eye. Okay? And some people it doesn't resolve. You should see when I go to the hospital to see patients, the therapists have the patients lined up in wheelchairs with patches on. I should take a, make a movie out. Because, you know, that's all the other doctors know to do. You have double vision, get rid of an eye. Well, the patching, again, NIH showed that uh, patching is the worst thing that you should be doing when there is a double vision. Because double vision is usually not all the time. You know, it might be 50% of the time or 10% of the time. So what are they saying? They're saying they have a problem getting their eyes to work together, right? So when you patch an eye, don't you get rid of their ability to get the eyes to work together ever? We don't patch people. The research studies indicate that, I shouldn't say we don't patch people, we don't patch people for more than a half hour at a time doing active procedures. The research has indicated through NIH that uh, active patching uh, for a half hour doing specific things like filling in the dots or stringing beads or you know hand-eye coordination kinds of things does more than passive patching. Putting a patch on and sending the kid to school. That's one of the cruelest things that happens in medicine today. Think about it. I can see the little letters in my right eye, but I'm five years old and I can't see the big E in my left eye. What happens to most of these kids in this country? They patch the good eye, the eye that sees the 2020, and they send them to school. It's scary. What happens? The kid learns to hate the patch, hate the doctor. It's not unusual for me to be the third or fourth eye doctor to see the patient, and when I walk in the room, they're scared to death of me. Because I'm gonna put those drops in, I'm gonna put patch in, and who knows, they think I'm going to put a shot in their eye. 
patching is something that if you know of anyone being patched, unfortunately the doctor they're working with is doing things that we did 20, 30, 40 years ago. The new studies indicate that patching, passive patching, should not be done. Now, impairment of binocular vision coordination is common with nystagmus patients, and deaf perception is indirectly impaired in many patients. Did you know that? Common. This is from uh, Dr. Richard Windsor, wrote an article on understanding nystagmus in the Vision Enhancement Journal. He also said vertigo or dizziness is also seen especially in the stagmas acquired later in life from the sensation of motion in vision. So these aren't things that maybe one or two of you guys have. This is a pretty common thing, and your doctor may not be looking for it. Because all eye doctors look for eyesight and eye health problems. We all do that. I don't care where you are in the world. If you're going to an eye doctor, they're going to look at eyesight and eye health. It's only the doctors who are called neuro-optometrists or doctors who are board certified in vision therapy, they gotta look at how the eyes work together and how do they move together. And depth perception and remembering what you're seeing and processing information. Now certainly any doctor can do it, but the reality is they don't. So vision therapy treatment programs involve feedback, visual feedback, auditory, tactile, proprioceptive. Anyone not heard of that word, proprioceptive? What it means is it's awareness of a person's position of one's body. Perception of movement, spatial orientation from receptors in the inner ear, muscles, nerves throughout the body. So that's the proprioceptive system. So in vision therapy, we're primarily doing visual, auditory, tactile, and proprioceptive feedback. Okay? In conjunction with visual attention, visual imagery, and most importantly, relaxation techniques. <coughs> so, uh, vision therapy using multi-sensory, I'm moving up to something. It's sort of breaking news that most of you probably have not heard of. Uh, vision therapy using multi-sensory approach in nystagmus improved visual acuity and related measures of visual function in the medical literature has been reported. What's been improved, reported is improved ability to sustain focus. Things don't get blurry as quickly or at all after the therapy. Because the therapy is designed to make you help you to sustain focus. How many of you, when you're reading or looking at the Blackberry or even looking at street signs, sometimes it's clear and sometimes it's fuzzy? Anybody ever see that? Yeah. Well, guess what? There are no glasses for that. I guess you can have a whole bag of glasses. It keeps changing, but there's no glasses that are going to fix that. And how would you know which one to put on? So we work on improved ability to sustain focus. The word sustain is critical. Better eye contact. Oh my gosh, how important is that? In social situations and trying to get a job and be able, the ability to, to, to maintain eye contact. Um, I offer a residency. Uh, a lucky new doctor gets to practice with me every year. My new resident just started and we just interviewed a few months ago all the new graduates who flew to my Bethesda office to get an interview. And first thing I do when I walk in, they're sitting in the chair and I walk in and I sit down and I say, why should I, why should I hire you? That's, you know, not even close, why should I hire you? I want to see what happens. And they say what they say. And I'll never forget this woman a few months ago. She's looking at the floor. She doesn't have nystagmus. She's looking at the floor. And she hands me a piece of paper. This is the answer to my question. question not a word, but it can be as what's this? She's still looking at the floor and she says, my grades. It's a very short interview. <laughs> Very short interview. Okay? If you can't look people in the eye, you're at a disadvantage. I don't have to tell you that. You know that. Less car or motion sickness, improved attention. These are things that have happened as a result of vision therapy that's documented in the medical literature. And are you ready for this? Uh, the stagnus can be volitionally reduced for short periods of time through vision therapy. Who's never heard of that? Yeah, it's in the medical literature. Uh, documented, up to two minutes in selected patients. Um, that's what's been documented. I work with a number of nystagmus patients. I've had it reduced as long as a half hour, but that's an important half hour if you get an interview. If you can learn how to stop the nystagmus, now not in every patient. Don't all you come make appointments with me to me saying, uh, I want to stop my nystagmus. I can help a select percentage of you. Uh, and there's some diagnostic tests that can tell you, tell me whether or not you're a candidate for this. 
Um, it's critical in business and social situations where eye contact is especially important. Now, just this statement that I just made, would, if I, I, I made this, uh, I gave a lecture to about 500 eye doctors in Orlando, Florida. And the response was, what? I don't believe it. I had the article. I had the, the journal that was published, and I said, come read the article. You haven't read it. Um, so we're going to talk about this concept of vision therapy, because it applies to nystagmus patients. It applies to people who don't have nystagmus. So first of all, what is visual fitness, and, and how can it be affecting your life? The internet eyes. Too many people spending too much time on the internet. And uh, you know, getting home from work, and you know, too tired to do anything but watch TV. And there's not much good on TV. You know, what's cable TV? 500 stations and nothing. Like, cable TV gets a thousand stations. So, unbelievable. Something's one station is 9.89. So it must be a thousand. I don't know. The night driving nightmare. Anybody who doesn't like to drive at night? Okay. There's a lot of people who don't like to drive at night, and they have good eyesight. What happens? It's a problem processing information centrally or peripherally. And at night, it's primarily a peripheral processing. And everybody's peripheral vision gets less at night. We can improve that in many cases. Counting the pages, three more pages, I'm going to put the darn book down. Anybody like that in this room? OK. Too tired to get a life, all the work that's been done, all the emails that have to be answered. On the iPhone now, you can have your emails while you're uh, walking home from work. It's unbelievable how connected we all are. Sports vision, we work with a lot of athletes. Uh, there's a Washington Nationals baseball player that we worked with last year who got a huge raise this year because he's hitting more home runs. That was my work with him. My son is an eye doctor in my practice. He's the vision consultant to an NBA basketball team, uh, the Arizona Suns. They fly him out to Phoenix, and he helps them select the draft choices and helps them to hopefully get into the playoffs next year. Let's all pray for the Arizona Suns. Um, wear them, you'll get used to them. Anybody get a pair of glasses? <coughs> Not thrilled with them? Go back to the doctor, and the doctor says, just wear them, you'll get used to them. Anybody ever heard that? Don't ever let it happen again. I'm telling you, if the glasses aren't right, right away, somebody made a mistake. Either the doctor did, or the optical made a mistake, you know? You walk into some of these opticals, and we're talking minimum wage people. They're helping you select frames. <laughs> that just learned uh, a couple hours ago, you know, how to help you select, be careful, be really careful. If there's a problem with you, or any member of your family, or one of your friends, and you get a pair of glasses and they're not right, there's a problem, you go back to the doctor. If the doctor says, well, I just tested you and I'm getting the same thing, and just wear them, you'll get used to them, you find another doctor. Um, seeing the sleep, using reading to, as a sleeping pill. Uh, that's okay if it's late at night. It's not okay if you're on the job or in school. And procedures to develop your visual, your, your visual fitness. Okay, so here's what I want you to think about. And this applies to uh, uh, patients who have nystagmus. Uh, it applies to people that you know that have nystagmus, this applies to people who don't have nystagmus. So I want you to think about the person who's learned to block out his surroundings in order to read on the subway. Maybe they're going to have trouble retrieving peripheral vision when driving at night. Anybody take the subway in DC? You've seen the people folding up the Washington Post in a special way so they only see like one column and, you know, and World War III could start and they wouldn't notice. This is not good. This is not the way we're made. We're made to hunt and fish and do uh, distance things. I promise you, you go up to the next person who's doing that and ask them if they like to drive at night. Of course, they'll call the cops, right? And start asking that. But, you know, this is, this is something that is related. So they're going to block out the periphery. I want you to think about the computer programmer who's learned to shrink the world to the size of the screen for many hours during the day. Maybe they're going to have trouble expanding that world back to the real size in order to play golf, tennis, or volleyball. Too much time on the computer, not what we're made to do. So what's that? What do you think? What do you see? What do you see? The view, okay. What do you see? Who said baby? There's a baby. Who sees the baby? 
Raise your hand. You see the baby? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anybody not see the baby? Raise your hand. If you do see it, you help the person next to you see it. See if we can all see the baby. I'll give you a hint. It's a big baby. <laughs> Anybody not see the baby? Who still doesn't see the baby? Okay. I will outline the baby for you. Okay. Watch the red dot. This is the baby's head. Can you see my eye? That's the baby's eye. The baby's looking up. Big baby. Okay. See what you have to do to see the baby? You have to expand your periphery. Because how many of you, when you looked at this, just saw a couple looking at the water? Yeah. Or just saw a tree, or maybe just saw the water there, a rock right here. That's central processing. Peripheral processing is who looked at it and saw a baby immediately? I think you did. Yeah. Somebody who can shift gears quickly from central to peripheral processing, that's what we call normal vision. And I'm telling you, this is something that can be learned. Many people learn it on their own, but the ones who don't get it are going to have symptoms. And that's something that we can teach through biofeedback in a therapy program. What I do is like physical therapy for the eyes. Okay? So, what is normal vision? If this is a table right here, and on this table are my keys, okay? And I have very central vision, like looking through paper towel holders. Okay, I'm on the computer all day, okay? And I mean, I'm not, I don't have any diseases. You know, I just have very central processing, okay? So I'm looking for my keys over here and over here on the table, and I can't find my darn keys. The only way I can see my keys is I have to have peripheral vision wide open to see everything on the table, and then I have to shift like this lady did to central vision to find my keys, okay? That's normal vision, being able to shift from peripheral to central. And if you have nystagmus, the studies indicate that this is particularly a problem for you. And this is something that can be learned in almost everybody. You're still gonna have nystagmus afterwards, or we may be able to teach you to stop it for, uh, I've personally seen up to a half hour, the literature, some of my friends have reported up to an hour with vision therapy. Uh, but the, you know, in the medical literature, the consensus now is up to 10 minutes until they have another study published that's double blind and placebo controlled and, and all the, the gold standard kinds of things. They do vision for the children. Yes, yes. Um, I work with, I'm, I'm trained in infant's vision, so I see very young children. My youngest is uh, uh, one or two days of life. Uh, and I also work with senior citizens. I don't limit my practice to any age group. And it's a family vision pra practice. We, we, we see people who just want glasses, you know, who just have a red eye. Um, I'm what's called an integrated physician because I integrate traditional along with non-traditional. So I do all the things you'd expect an eye doctor to do. I prescribe glasses, contact lenses. If you have a red eye, I can call a prescription into the pharmacy. We do many surgical procedures. but. I integrate some non-traditional things along with the traditional things. Because, for example, if you have chronic dry eye, there ain't a drop in the world that's really gonna make this all go away. But if you start taking some fish oil, and we change your diet, and you know, and we integrate some non-traditional things, there are many patients that can get rid of things like, like dry eye. Or chronic styes. You know, I had a patient who, uh, a couple of weeks ago, came in with six bottles of eye drops with six different doctors' names on them for these styes that she keeps getting. And um, we got rid of it by really altering her lifestyle and altering her diet. So here's a, a technique you can start doing at home today to expand your peripheral vision. So if you thought you were just going to sit here and listen, this is going to be going to work. Okay? So you can do this just as easily as I do, but let's all do it together, okay? Um, all you're doing is looking at the word clear. That's all you're doing, okay? Don't look at anything else, just the word clear. With your side vision, you want to get all the A's in focus. You're not looking at the A's, it's your side vision, okay? Then you shift to the B's, only looking at the word clear the whole time, 
and then you ship to the seas. So in other words, you're looking at the word clear, you get all the A's in focus with your side vision, hold it for four seconds, then all the B's, and then all the C's, four seconds, and then you go down to the B's for four seconds, then the A's, and once you can do it on a piece of paper here, you do it over here, and you do it up there, and you do it here. Very few people have problems doing it when it's on the screen like this, because distance vision, think about your peripheral vision, is not much, but now put it on a piece of paper and bring it real close, now you're, you're, you're really simulating way out here. So the, the easier, the, the harder, the further away you go, the easier, the closer you get, the easier. Um, this is explained in uh, much greater detail along with many other uh, procedures uh, that you can start doing right away in, in my book. Um, so nine ways people can benefit from vision therapy. Um, improving vision, uh, with, with, with vision, improving vision by reading and learning problems. We work with a lot of patients who uh, have, uh, are reluctant readers, and um, we can turn many of them, not all of them, into avid readers. That's to be a vision problem. Um, how many of you read the article uh, that you did on me last year in the New York Times? Anybody get the New York Times Sunday Magazine? Okay, go to my website. You can, I have a link right to the New York Times. The New York Times came to my office in Bethesda for a week last year, and they interviewed patients and parents, and um, they uh, interviewed uh, uh, um, uh, the, the children, and the children and you know, parents were saying, oh, the, my kid hated to read, now he loves to read, and, and, and kids were saying, well, I hated baseball, now I'm the captain of the baseball team. So, I mean, it was in the Sunday New York Times Magazine, um, if you read that, you know that those are usually large articles with lots of words on each page. There's eight pages. The first four pages were completely positive about me and the therapy and the parents saying I would have sold the car to pay for this if I had to. Then you can always find doctors to disagree about any treatment program. I don't care what it is. So they found some doctors that accused me of doing eye training. There was no such thing. The only thing that helps eyesight is glasses or contact lenses or, or LASIK, eye surgery. There's no such thing as eye training. And then the last two pages, total of eight, were parents saying, this is the best thing we've ever done. I wish we'd known about this sooner. Um, this was a, a program that changed my child's life. So it's a really good balanced article, I think, about, because anything you get involved with, any kind of treatment program, uh, if you're like me, you like to hear all the sides. You don't want to just hear one side because I'm telling you, any treatment program, any surgery you're thinking of doing, there will be doctors that will tell you not to, okay? And, and so it's good, you just go to my website, you, you click on my name, visionhealth.com, to the right, New York Times, click on it, you go right to the New York Times website, okay? So lazy eye, amblyopia, anybody in the room with lazy eye or amblyopia? No matter what lens you use, you can't see the small letter. Should be more than that in the room, okay? Okay, well, guess what? Um, in many cases, not all, NIH has shown it's never too late to treat a lazy eye. If your doctor told you you're too old, you used to say over age three it's too late, over age six they said it was too late, uh, nine, and then NIH did a, a big study to indicate uh, lazy eye can, improve, can be improved at any age. Um, cross eyes, eyes that turn in or out or up or down, um, enhancing sports performance, we talked about aiding people after a stroke, brain trauma, nystagmus, visual disturbances, and double vision, uh, nearsightedness, um, if your prescription keeps getting stronger, uh, anybody in the room who goes to the eye doctor and keeps getting stronger and stronger prescriptions, okay, well, guess what? Your eyes aren't growing, and as long as eye disease can be ruled out, um, and by eye disease, I mean retinal problems or cataracts or glaucoma. As long as that can be ruled out, it's generally a result of this central peripheral relationship. And that can be stabilized. In many cases, alleviating headaches from the workplace, helping tired eyes, improve skills in visually related children, particularly children with autism. So here we have, a, a, say, a nine-year-old who has eye movement skills like a three- or four-year-old. How do I know that? So here's something you can uh, uh, do right away with uh, uh, in your loved ones, or even uh, you get somebody to do it to you. You take a pen, very expensive piece of equipment, or your finger, 
And you just follow, okay, ask to follow across your visual field. You say follow, okay? Now, if you're age five or older, and you do it like this, there's a problem. At age five, there should be no head movement. Anyone who's still moving the head, anyone who can't separate eyes from head over the age of five, there's a developmental problem. So I had a nine-year-old who, when I said to follow this across the visual field, uh, the whole body, everything went. And when I said, okay, now try and keep your head still, she couldn't do it. So I had the mother come over and try and hold the head. Try and hold it still. So the mother's holding the head so they couldn't move the head. And this is what we saw, the stagnancy. And I said, you ever seen that before? She says, no, no, is, is everything all right? I said, no, it, it's, everything's all right, but there's a developmental immaturity, okay? So this was a nine-year-old with visual skills like a three or four-year-old, because that's what you expect to see in any three or four-year-old that you do the test with, okay? But now think of what a three or four-year-old is being asked to do, and now you think about what a nine-year-old is being asked to do. It's very different. So this is a nine-year-old who is definitely what the mother calls a reluctant reader. Knows how to read. Last thing they're going to do is read. And it's torture to get them to read. And so the goal here is to develop these skills and abilities, which we can do in many cases. Not all cases, but in many cases. So what is a three-year-old being asked to do? Well, believe it or not, some of them are reading. They shouldn't be. But there's some three-year-olds. And you know, when I went to public school around here, and uh, no one taught anybody to read at my age years ago until second grade. That's when we learned to read. Then it was first grade. I don't know where it is where you all live, but around here, the first day of kindergarten, everybody's reading. It's not right. Their eyes aren't ready. And I have never been so busy as I have been over the last several years with developmental vision problems, people being asked to do things that they're developmentally not ready to do, okay? So there's acquiring this stagnus, adult onset, result of an accident, illness, affecting the motor system. Sometimes strabismus, that means an eye's out or in or up or down, can result. Um, acquired brain injury, you have my hand out to read further. Um, everything I'm saying today is actually on the website as well, visionhealth.com, oscillopsia, experiencing the world jiggling, poor eyesight, and balance problems, okay? So it can be a result of a car accident, nystagmus. Um, millions of stroke and TBI, traumatic brain injury survivors, suffer from visual problems. And nystagmus, other forms of jerky eye movements can result. And impairments in saccades result in difficulty reading smoothly along the line of print. And why is that? Because if I say, go from one finger to the other, and going from one finger, ideally you go from one finger to the other, okay? But if you stop in the middle and then go to that, that's called an undershoot, or go from one thing to the other, but end up here and have to come back, it's called an overshoot. So check that out. And some of your family members, uh, some of your loved ones, have people do it on you. You'll see that, you know, ideally what you're looking for, if you are literally age five or above, which is you know, most people, is the eyes should be moving smoothly and going from one object to the other, no undershooting, no overshooting, ideally. Okay, so if there could be a visual field loss, a sphintoma, depression, neglect. Um, this was published some years ago in the Archives of Physical Medicine. Uh, vision therapy prisms, binasal occlusion, those are patches I'll show you in just a moment. They're very helpful in improving binocular integration and double vision from extraocular muscle movement disorders in TBI, traumatic brain injury patients, okay? Um, so we have a lot of people having these issues. Um, I want to talk about two conditions that affect patients with nystagmus. Two visual conditions. There are many, but this is what, these are two that you may not be that familiar with. Okay? One is visual midline shift syndrome. Okay? So what that means is vision is normally matched with kinesthetic, proprioceptive, vestibular function, and disruption in the coherence of these systems can cause the visual to visually judge objects that are located along the patient's anatomical midline to be to not to not be at their anatomical midline. In other words, this is straight ahead normally for me, but if I have a visual midline shift syndrome, I really think that's straight ahead. Okay, or I might think this is straight ahead. We have ways to find that out. Okay, 
And if there's a visual midline shift syndrome, then the perception of your own midline shifts. So walls may seem to lean on you. Or uh, the horizon may slant. It can cause dizziness, nausea, spatial orientation, poor balance. When posture is a person unconsciously leans to one side and, or the other to adjust the perceived midline or horizontal tilt. We use prisms and therapy to eliminate this in most cases. So let me get to the second one, post-trauma vision syndrome, PTBS. Now this is a condition in the neurological literature that results in, meaning the eyes turn out, okay, uh, convergence problems, focusing problems, eye movement problems, double vision headaches, problems maintaining eye contact, could be a visual field loss, can't see things right here, can't see things right here, certain sector, difficulty reading, words may appear to move, difficulty keeping track of place of page, low blink rate, dry eyes, staring behavior. Okay? What are the complaints, PTBS patients? Now, what complaints, that means the double vision, blurry vision, perceived movement of print or stationary objects, asynopia means eye strain, headaches, particularly frontal or temporal, phonophobia, light sensitivity. It's not uncommon for patients with PTBS to, um, you've been all been to the eye doctor, and you know we work in these little dark rooms, and the patient's sitting in the chair, and I walk in in a little dark room, and the patient's wearing really dark sunglasses in my dark room, okay? And, um, you know, they're, they're 20 20. Their eyesight's fine, but they're light sensitive. What is a sunglass? It reduces the amount of light, you know, that comes into the brain. So, there's this difference between eyesight and vision. Eyesight is the ability to see clearly at 20 feet. Vision goes way beyond this. And the vestibular system, as I mentioned, it's this orienting system for auditory and visual, and it answers two questions. Where am I going? He's wondering where he's going. Which way is up? Okay, those are two really important questions. Where am I going and which way is up? Can you imagine? Getting to lunch in a little while, if you didn't know where you were going, and you didn't know which way is up, gravity is one of the most basic things we have to deal with. So it's a motor center, and visual problems causing dizziness and balance problems. And zirconia means the world is one size in my left eye and a different size in my right eye. What's the brain to do with that? Okay, that's more common than you would think. A vertical imbalance, one eye sees things a little higher than the other. Binocular vision problem, a convergence problem, or an intermittent turn of an eye, double vision, uh, re stereopsis, reduced depth perception, ambient visual disorder, problem with peripheral vision, and eye movement disorders, okay? So sometimes the treatment involves some specific kind of occlusion, which is called a Bangarter occluder. This is not a pirate patch. You can still sort of see his eye, right? But this allows for binocular vision, but it eliminates double vision in selected patients. Okay, so in other words, it's all the benefit of a patch, but none of the disadvantages of the patch. And there's various degrees of uh, uh, how dark can that uh, Van Garner patch be? How much light is allowed to come in? 5% up to 90% of the light, okay? And so if you look at this, you can see his right eye is turned into his nose. You see that? That's called strabismus. Kind of hard to see in the lighting here, okay? We just put those glasses on and look what happened. It straightened his eye, okay? Simple, simple approach. I always like to do the simple approach first. Um, and we can also have a sector occlusion in the glasses. Again, this is not pirate patch, but this is a problem with double vision in this patient in the left periphery. And we got rid of it with a simple patch. And this is a press-on patch, uh, not very expensive at all, okay? Uh, it, just, it just fits right on the, the lens. Um, and what it does is it moves things. So uh, if the lens wasn't there, the pencil would be up and down. But the lens pushed the pencil to the right. See that? Okay? So it's a prism that moves things. So for example, um, if you have a problem with uh, left visual field neglect, 
In other words, you pay attention to everything over here, but you sort of neglect the stuff over here. Okay. Um, how important would it be to have a pair of glasses that would move the world to the left? We know how to do that. Is it being done? Um, not much. I do it in the rehab hospital all the time. Um, these are grounded prisms. We call them ugly prisms. We don't prescribe these anymore because we have better ways of doing it. And it could be a spot prism. Here we have a prism where just a certain section of the right visual field is causing some double vision. And we've identified that through the protocol and using a lens to try and eliminate that. And that's what it looks like you know, in the pair of glasses. And it, look, it looks like it might be obvious. It's really not. You have to be pretty close to somebody to really see that. It's, it's not cosmetically that objectionable. Here we have just, just a, a prism just in the upper field of the right eye. That's where the double, every time he looks up, he has double vision. It was a big problem for him because his wife insisted that the flat screen TV go above the fireplace. Ooh. And the sofa's down below, and he's looking up. And he doesn't want to see two football games on one TV. Okay? This solved the problem for him, rather simply. Okay, so if you have a problem with hemianopsia, meaning a part of your visual field is, is hard to pay attention to, or it might be damaged, uh, then, then you're going to have problems like shopping in the mall. If you have double vision, you might have problems dialing the phone. You have this visual midline shift. Everything straight ahead is really to the left, uh, or vice versa. You might walk into things, or poor saccades. Remember the, uh, one object to the other? Right, problems reading. Slow visual motor visual response. Problems driving. What's so important in driving is visual reaction time. Being able to make some decisions very quickly. Eyesight is not as important as visual reaction time. And I wish all the department of vehicles uh, would start testing for visual reaction time. I think we have a lot less accidents because visual reaction time can be sped up through therapy. Uh, lots of research studies on visionhealth.com. We have a whole section on research studies about things that we're talking about today, just to let you know that it's there. Um, but this um, PhD neuropsychologist uh, has a very interesting statement. Uh, he's at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. Recent evidence from a number of state-of-the-art laboratories for neurobiology indicates that visual, tactile, and motor systems remain modifiable to a significant degree well into adulthood. Don't let any doctor tell you you're too old. Really, to do almost anything. Uh, if a doctor says that, it's time to go to another doctor because, you know, it's almost 2012. We can do an awful lot of things that uh, we couldn't do. Just to show you some of the vision therapy techniques that we do, um, she has to uh, use blocks to go through saccadic fixations and pursuits. That's what I used to look like with a beard. Um, I shaved because I was looking a little bit too much like Santa Claus. Uh, so we have these red-green filters on. So one eye only sees the red lines. The other eye only sees the green lines, okay? So, and he's got a golf tee, and there's holes, and this is a rotator. So we're working on ocular motor pursuits. We're working on binocular vision, simultaneous perception. And here I have some lenses that I'm doing to load the technique, making it uh, even more challenging, because he has to focus harder when I put these lenses in. And we work on balance, using balance board. He has to drop the ball or the beanbag into the can while he has the prisms on and looking straight ahead. Not an easy thing to do. Uh, posture is so important. We have therapy balls. We have red green glasses that are being used. Um, there's my book. Um, go to ipowerbook.com. We have uh, new endorsements that uh, go on. We just put a couple of them on last week. Um, I wrote it with a patient. Uh, this is a patient who I worked with years ago who had a dramatic improvement in her vision, uh, wasn't able to read, now loves reading, and now she's 85, she just won another golf tournament at 85. And everybody crowds after her and says, what vitamins are you on? And she hands out the book we write. So she insisted that we write this book. I'm a clinician, I'm really not an author. She's the author, she's written over a dozen books. And so uh, I want her husband went through the program, all five of her kids went through the program. When it came time for her grandchildren to go through vision therapy, because they all needed it, pretty strong hereditary predisposition, which tells you that it runs in families, uh, she said, we're right to book. And that's what this is. And when the book went to, uh, just before it went to press, uh, the publisher called me 
and said, Stan, your book's about to go to press. I think somebody made a big mistake. I I've never seen a book with such huge margins and such large print. I said, no mistake, it's intentional. My patients don't see so well. So that's a really pretty friendly book you know, to read. Um, and um, if you don't want to get it now, you can just go to iPowerBook.com and get it at Amazon. Uh, I just looked on today, and uh, for the second week in a row, if you look at books on Amazon and you just type in the word vision therapy, because you know you can search any topic you want, any book you want on vision therapy, we're the number one book in the world. Now that doesn't say much because there aren't many books. You know, there's <laughs> okay. So there's also another good book to get: Brain Injury Medicine, uh, written by Zassler. Uh, there's a whole chapter on evaluating and treating visual dysfunction. Uh, many of the things that we talked about today, if your doctor or therapist is not familiar with it, you refer them to this book. Most of them have it. It's one of those great big thousand dollar books. Oh, it's a thousand dollars. It's one of those great big books that most uh, doctors, most physiatrists, most rehabilitation professionals are familiar with. Okay? Resources in terms of looking at more information. Um, I'm going to make sure we have time for questions. I'm almost finished, so think about any questions you might have. Uh, Nora, Neurooptometric Rehab Association, nora.cc, and the visionhealth.com website for more information. And lastly, tell me what this is. It's not a baby. Any idea? Take a guess. What do you see? A peacock. Okay, I hear that a lot. What do you see? It's not like a cat. A cat? I hear that a lot. It's not that. It might help if I orient it properly. Now it's oriented properly. <clears throat> that help anybody? Come on, my ladies who know the baby real quickly. What is it? No idea? Nobody sees it? Usually there's one or two in the room. You're in the perfect place to tell me what it is. <laughs> no? Nothing? I'll give you a hint. A what? A cow. A cow. All right. I knew there'd be one. All right. It's a cow. Does that help anybody? Help her. Help everybody. Let's have this young lady tell everybody. Can you tell everybody? How to look at it. The ears are on the either side. The nose is in the middle. It's like facing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so some of you are getting it. Who has no idea what we're talking about? Raise your hand. Okay. You see, you all might have great eyesight, but do you have good vision? Vision allows you to see the cow as quickly as this lady did. So what you're hearing is some people going, aha, there's the cow, okay? We call that the aha phenomenon. Um, if we had a functional MRI, which we've done this in many cases while you were trying to see the cow, we would measure the visual centers of your brain lighting up. It's amazing what we can do these days, okay? This is what we try and do in vision therapy every hour that the patient comes for treatment. We're trying to get two or three ahas out of the patient. Because when we get that aha, when this lady said, oh, it's a cow, the visual centers of her brain literally lit up. So, anybody still not see it? New people. Maybe I should let you worry about it. And, uh, no. Okay, let me help you. Okay, once again, it's a big cow. It's a big picture, okay? So here's an eye, and there's an eye. Does that help anybody? I see it. Okay, that helps somebody. Let me know when you get it. Here's a big ear. There's another big ear. The cow's looking at you. This is the cow's head. See that big head? This is the cow's nose. Here's an eye. Here's another eye. Who still doesn't see it? So that helped a lot of you. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for your attention.
I uh, hope everybody got a handout. I have a few more left if you need it. Um, if there's questions, um, you'll go to um, my email. It's uh, stan at visionhealth.com. Uh, I do look at that regularly. Um, and um, if there's any questions, you let me know. And uh, again, thank you for your attention. And I hope you have an enjoyable rest of the meeting. Thank you. You're welcome. We thank you again for stopping in this year. You're welcome. And hopefully we'll see you again in two years. Okay. Uh, everyone, we will be drinking for lunch. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. Otherwise, uh, we'll see everyone at lunch and then back here for the next set of breakouts. I'll be here for a while and if anybody has any questions, just come to the front.